As I mentioned, today will be our second week in Revelation chapter 14. This message is titled, God's Angels of Judgment, part number two. But before I get into the message, let me tell you about one other lady who sat at the dining room table. Miss Annie Panel is 93 years old. She had had hip surgery several weeks before I began eating in the dining room. Now, Annie was a talkative, even though she was often repetitive. As you can imagine, at 93, she was also hard of hearing. So I functioned as the go-between uh, her and between Mary Medlin, uh, who was a stroke victim, that I spoke about two weeks ago. Annie had only one son alive at this point, and she talked about him nearly every meal. She kept things lively at our table, and all of us had a tendency to laugh together. My point in this is to tell you that we all helped each other. I think that was one of the blessings of sitting there in the dining room and sharing details about our lives together. Well, if you would turn to Revelation chapter number 14. I want to go over verses number 6 through 10. Remember, this is a message from John the Revelator. John sees the things that Jesus wants him to see. John, who is a revelator, reveals things that otherwise we would not know about. So starting in chapter 14 with verse number 6 and down through verse 10, John reveals these important things. He said, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them, unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Shall we bow in prayer together? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that you revealed this important message to John, who wrote it down and revealed it unto us so that even now, more than 2,000 years later, we can read the words of this revelation and we can just revel in its great and sometimes to some people hidden meaning. Lord, I know that this is the third of five parenthetical passages in Revelation. <coughs> I know that this is a beautiful chapter who reveals to us in chapter 14, much about the revelation that you gave to John, who passed it on down through the churches, who passed it on down through what John saw taking place in heaven. So, Lord, I just want to thank you for what you've shared with us, for this important message. And I just ask that you would help us in our understanding of revelation. In Jesus' name, amen. This chapter falls between the seventh trumpet of Revelation 11:15 and the pouring out of the first vial of judgment in Revelation 16:2. If you remember in our study of Revelation so far, that in Revelation there are three sets of seven judgments each. There are seven seals. There are seven. Um, trumpet judgments, 
And then when that seventh trumpet is blown, there are seven vials or bowl judgments. These are poured out over the whole earth. And each set of judgments seem to progress getting worse and worse over the people who are judged upon this earth. So these three sets of judgments each show a progression of God pouring out his wrath upon those who are on the earth. As we go on, we find that when the seven seals are open, back in Revelation chapter number 6, on through Revelation chapter 8, we see the passions of man, long restrained by God, they are removed and have now come to full fruition. We also see a state of complete chaos on the earth, now ruled by Satan. The world has united together under Satan's banner, accepting him as their Messiah and offering their worship both to him and his Antichrist. So from this point on, God rescues man and rescues the world from the clutches of Satan. We are now approaching the battle of Armageddon and the millennial kingdom of Christ Jesus. In this passage, the first angel preaches the everlasting gospel and a warning of certain judgment. The second angel announces Babylon is fallen. And while I won't repeat all of those words, the angel goes on to say, she made uh, all the nations, oh, excuse me, I skipped a little bit, um, of the everlasting gospel and a warning of certain judgment. Then the second angel pronounces Babylon is fallen. She made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon refers to one of two things as best I can tell. It could refer to the actual city of Rome or the city of Babylon itself. Frankly, I don't know. There are many Bible scholars who would tell us that this does refer to the city of Rome because it mentions about this city setting on seven hills. But it also could refer to the city of Babylon who also was a center of evil worship and, and great sin in itself. And this is another one of those passages in Revelation where I just have to be frankly honest with you, I don't know. But you know in a way that is good. I'm being honest with you. I'm trying to tell it the way I understand it and the way that I receive it. Then there is the third angel who announces, if anyone receives the mark of the Antichrist, they will be tormented forever and ever. What this passage tells me is that the worshipers of the beast, also known as the Antichrist, will have no rest day or night. But elsewhere in Revelation, it tells us that they would be tormented forever and ever. As we go on through Revelation, it tells us that the Christian martyr suffers for a short time here on this earth, but then will receive, will be received into God's eternal rest. In other words, we as Christians who don't receive the mark of the beast will receive the blessing of God. I don't know about where you stand on this, but where I see this is that God has an eternal blessing prepared for us. We may not see it right now, but we do see enough scripture that tells us that God gives us the victory in the end. I would much rather give up the short temporal curses of this world than to receive the curse of eternity. I would much rather receive what God wants to bless us with than what God wants to punish us with. And frankly, God doesn't want to punish us with the eternal, uh, uh, with the eternal torments, I guess is what I want to say. But God would rather us be received into his eternal blessing. So, 
Let's go on just a little bit. The book of Revelation is filled with sorrow, with strife, and with tears. The worshipers of the Antichrist have mouths filled with blasphemy. But on the other hand, the worshipers of Jesus Christ have their mouths filled with song. I sort of alluded to this a little bit in my message last Sunday. But I want to take this even farther along. Our God is a happy God. His people are happy people. God has an amazing ability to make his people happy. The gods of the pagans are fierce, they are wicked, and they are cruel. They delight in the fears and sufferings of men. But I want to remind you again that our God is a happy God. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we sing, unlike those that worship the beast. We not only sing, but we're filled with songs full of joy. I noticed that when I was in the rehab center. When my mind finally came back to me and I began to talk, I know on many, many occasions my heart was filled with songs for the Lord. So many, many, many songs worshiping and praising the God who saved me. And do you remember the words of the song Ring the Bells that I sang just a little bit ago? The words start off through the ages. Church bells rang, the good news through the land, that God has put joy bells within us, and they're not rung with human hands. Music leads the soul to singing. Music makes the heart to swell. Gospel is the good news ringing. Come on, ring those bells. Zion, you are known for singing. Sing of your great coming King. Let the church rise up rejoicing. Oh, what power it will bring. Lifting hands and hearts in praises. In our praise, His Spirit dwells. And that's what David wrote back in the book of Psalms. That God delights in our songs of praise. God is lifted up during those times that we sing. So in our praise, His Spirit dwells. Join the everlasting chorus. Come on, ring those bells. And then the chorus of this song goes, Ring the bells. Ring those bells. Make sweet music for the soul. Ring the bells. Ring the bells. Let the hallelujahs roll. Sing of victory in Jesus. Sing of joy no tongue can tell. Amazing grace. How sweet the music. Come on. Ring those bells. Would you like to know the secret of success? I think it was... Oh. Now his name escapes me. <laughs> you may have to get used to that. But if you want to be distressed, look within. If you want to be defeated, look back. If you want to be distracted, look around. If you want to be dismayed, look ahead. But if you want to be delivered, look up to our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one and the only one who can give us the secret for success. As I've closed many of the last few services, the altar call is open. The invitation is for you to come and to pray at the altar. And the prayer for salvation is as simple as A, B, and C. 
A stands for admit to the Lord Jesus Christ that you are a sinner. B stands for believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. The letter C stands for confess to others that Christ Jesus is your Lord. Beloved, we are in those last days. Are you ready for the Lord's return? Because it could be today. It could be before we are dismissed to eat our lunch. It could happen any moment. Are you ready for our Lord's return? As I mentioned last week, don't be like Lot's wife, who turned back with a longing to head back to Sodom. But rather, be like Lot and his daughters. I don't approve of what all they did. But they were chosen by God. The sin that they committed was not something that God was proud of. But he still used Lot and his daughters to continue on that family line. Are you ready for the Lord's return? We are in those last days. Jesus could come back today. I don't know if he will or not, but I know that he could come back today. Are you ready? The coming of the Lord draweth nigh. This could be your last chance to find Jesus. This could be the last chance for today. This could be the last chance that you have to trust Christ Jesus. Again, I would ask you, are you ready? The coming of the Lord could be today. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. I come to you, dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. Lord, my heart does swell with that gospel music. My heart does swell with the the thoughts that you could send your Son, Jesus Christ, back to this earth even today. My heart does swell knowing that you hear our prayers and answer our prayers. I know many, many, many thousands of prayers were sent up on my behalf. I still feel the power of those prayers working in my heart and in my life. I know, dear Lord, that you desire to draw near to us just as we desire to draw near to you. And so, Lord, I come with you again today asking you to bless us, asking you to bless that which we are to receive, and in fact, blessing each and every meal we partake of and each and every food that we are to receive. So, Lord, I I ask you in Jesus' name, that you might help us to walk closer to you, that you might help us to walk in newness of the Spirit, and that you might help us to walk in faith, not by sight. Lord, I ask you this, and Lord, I also ask that there might be some lost people that will come to the altar today. I ask you that we who are looking for a blessing might receive that, In Jesus' name I pray, amen.